So last week I made a video about how when moving files from OneDrive to Google Drive caused me an issue because Google Drive doesn't do this nifty feature that the OneDrive has called Files On Demand. A couple of people commented that I was using the wrong Google Drive app and um, well, who'd have known it? But they were right. So I thought this week was pretty timely to do a video on a bit of a comparison between Google, Microsoft, Apple, Dropbox, since they're probably the most well-known file syncing apps out there. There are also others like Amazon and Azure files, but um, as those typically get a lot more involved, um, I thought we'd stick to just those for today, but I might touch on them uh, very, very briefly. Anyway, so to keep this fair, we're going to address each service purely based on the storage service offering. We're not going to get into the intricacies of 365 versus G Suite. We'll also address a few key areas for each product. Pricing, user experience, sharing, backup or intention, data sovereignty, and reliability slash uptime. So firstly, uh, let's talk Microsoft. On a personal level, you can get five gig for free. You can upgrade to 100 gig for 199 or pay 59.99 per year for one terabyte of space. On the business side of things, you get one terabyte OneDrive with most of the paid for plans. And since you're already likely already subscribed to, to Office 365, then you already have this at no additional cost. Now, in terms of accessing the OneDrive, the app runs pretty much on, on anything Mac, Windows, mobile, even on platforms like Microsoft Xbox. So a couple of things I like about this, it's a single app for personal and business OneDrive accounts, and you can sign into multiple accounts without any issues. Their files on demand feature, which I mentioned last week, which only downloads files that you've, you've recently accessed to save your space on your machine. Multiple people can work on the, on the same files at the same time and see edits live and, and platforms like Microsoft Power Automate can be used to, to totally automate the, the creation and movement of your files. A few things I don't like. Well, with files on demand, you can't choose how long to keep the files. I'd love to be able to set, say, seven days or 30 days before the files are then removed from the cache locally to, to save you space. But actually, none of the apps have that feature, so it's not really specific to OneDrive. Now, the biggest bugbear I have with OneDrive is their maximum file size limit, which is 15 gig, because sometimes these video files that I produce are 60 gig. Nice. Now, when it comes to sharing, as you'd expect, of course, you can share the files and folders with, with anybody, internal, external, and yes, key note here, those without a Microsoft account can even edit the documents. You can also set a date for when access expires, and you can also set a password to access, which is a pretty neat feature for, for security. Now, as far as backups go, as I've mentioned in plenty of my other videos, Office 365 is not backed up. Now, Microsoft even state this in their terms and conditions when you go and sign up, that you need to find a third-party backup tool to back up your data. So whilst, yes, you might have a copy of the data on your machine, which is then also stored in the Microsoft Cloud, this doesn't protect you from deleting something accidentally and, and not realizing until six months later, at which point it's too late. The file has gone forever to the dusty graveyard of the discarded Word and Excel files, probably also where the uh, Microsoft Paperclip has gone to rest. Now for data sovereignty, you can check where your data is stored by going to the Office 365 Admin Center. You go to Settings, Organization Profile, Data Location. But generally speaking, if you signed up for Office 365 in the UK, then your data will be stored in the UK. In other news, only a few selected 365 services are stored outside of the UK. So follow the link in the comments below to see what those services uh, might be. Oh, also a, a point of note here, Microsoft offer their multi-geo service where your data can be localized where it needs to be or on an individual basis is only offered to companies with over 500 seats. So if you truly are a global organization and you need your data sovereignty to be localized around the globe, then that's a good feature for you. And I actually applaud Microsoft for giving administrators the choice and visibility here, whilst most online storage services will be the likes of GDPR, PCI DSS, and ISO compliance. There is still a hurdle that some business owners struggle with when they know that their data is physically located in the US. It raises questions over the US government having access to their data, even behind all of the strict regulations and, and all of their compliance. Onto the reliability, and what I've done here is I've done a Google News search for outages for each of these products. On the 2nd of May 2019, there was a three-hour outage. 
on the 30th of January 2019, there was a four hour outage. Uh, there was another four hour outage on the 29th of November in 2018. And then we're right back to March 2017. On to Google this time. This is what caught me out before. So Google's product, which is named Google Drive, which you still access by browsing to drive.google.com, used to use the application called Google Drive. And in fact, you can still download the Google Drive app on your mobile device. On Mac and PC, you don't download Google Drive anymore. You used to. You now download either Google Backup and Sync, or if you're a business user, you can also download Google Drive File Stream. Simples. So therein lies my first issue. Uh, akin to Microsoft's recent rebrand of their Microsoft Flow platform to Microsoft Power Automate. Yet, lots of literature and URLs still talk about Microsoft Flow. Except, Google launched their Drive file stream in 2017, two and a half years ago, yet they still don't seem to have their name standardized across the board. Thus, the confusion in my previous video. With that aside, personally, you get 15 gig for free, which is pretty cool. 100 gig for 15.99 a year, so cheaper than Microsoft OneDrive. 200 gig for 24 pounds a year, two terabytes for 79.99 a year, and that goes right up to 10, 20, 30 terabytes of storage. Now from a business perspective on G Suite, you can pay four pounds 60 per user per month for 30 gig of cloud storage. And then from £9.20 upwards on their plans, you get unlimited cloud storage, providing you have more than five users, which is a shame, but I guess it stops people like me uh, abusing the free storage. Again, you may have already been subscribed to G Suite for, for your email and other features, so this could be something that you already have at no additional cost. Once you've got your head around the different client applications, it's actually pretty good. With Google Backup and Sync, you can back up folders outside of your Google Drive folders, so your desktops or your download folders, but, but this client stores everything on your machine. Unless you specifically don't sync certain folders, meaning you either need to use the web client to get access or a massive hard drive to store everything locally. Over to Google File Stream, it works in a very similar way to, to OneDrive. Files stay in the cloud until you access them, then they download and store them on your machine while you're accessing them and then get cached for a, for a little while. And then in terms of using multiple accounts, again, confusion strikes. Whilst I was successful in adding two Google accounts into Google Backup and Sync, which essentially runs two separate instances in the taskbar on my Mac, a post on the Google forum states that you can sign into up to three Google accounts at the same time, yet literally the line below that, it states that there isn't a built-in feature to use two accounts at the same time. On the other hand, with Google File Stream, you can't use multiple accounts. You can only use just the one. So from a cost perspective, the fact you get unlimited storage for a relatively low monthly price means that as a pure file storage, Google Drive so far wins the debate for me. When it comes to sharing, of course, you can share internally and externally with a caveat. If the person you're sending to doesn't have a Google account, they can only view the files, they can't edit them. So Microsoft and OneDrive has a bit of a one-up on Google here, uh, but a counter to that is likely who doesn't have a Google account of some form nowadays. Worth noting here, you can also change permissions for sharing externally from, from an administrator's level to prevent people sharing outside of the company if you wish, as you can with OneDrive. As far as backups come, once again, the same story. Google Drive is not backed up. But outside of that, they have a short window of 25 to 30 days for being able to actually recover any deleted files. Data sovereignty. Now, Google doesn't provide any facility to, to choose or determine where your actual data is located. They state that their data is replicated throughout multiple locations for, for resiliency. So they're not as transparent as Microsoft, but just a reminder that both Microsoft and Google's offerings are fully compliant with the likes of GDPR and PCI DSS, healthcare and, and other regulations. Of course, with that said, you best double check with any specifics if you need to be legally compliant. One thing just to note here as well I noticed is that Google doesn't provide their data processing amendment or the model contract clauses for anyone not using the business G Suite platform. On to reliability. So according to my research, there was an outage on the 27th of January that lasted for around one hour. 
on the 19th of August for around 2019 for around two hours, on the 17th of April 2019 for around two hours, on the 13th of March 2019 for around four hours. Now over to Dropbox. So Dropbox personal plans get you two terabytes of space for $7.99 a month or three terabytes for $16.58 per month. On the business side of things, it's £10 per month for a minimum of three users and you get five terabytes of space. And then it's £15 per user per month for a minimum again of three users with unlimited space. Which is a shame again, if you're a single user or only a couple of users wanting access to the business features because you're forced to pay for three users. Sharing wise, you can share externally of course, and similar to others, a caveat that if you share a folder that's being accessed by multiple people, then the other end will need to sign up for at least a free Dropbox account. Otherwise, they'll only be able to, to download and view the files. Now, from a backup and recovery perspective, the personal two terabyte plan gets you 30 days actual backup and version history, and the three terabyte plan has 180 days. But all of the business plans also have 180 days which is miles better than, than Microsoft or Google, anybody so far. So thumbs up to Dropbox. Dropbox also has Smart Sync, which is their version of only downloading the files that you need to store locally. Uh, this is only available on their plus professional and business accounts. So personal accounts, you don't get this feature. On to data sovereignty. With Dropbox, again, it's the likes of ISO and GDPR compliance, but you don't get to choose where your data is located unless you have 15 users or more, where you can specify their EU-based data hosting service. Otherwise, data is stored in primarily in the US, uh, but also in Germany, Australia, and Japan. On to outages. So on June the 6th, 2019, there was a two hour outage. And to be honest, that's actually all of the ones that appeared in the Google News Feeds when I, when I searched for the exact same search terms as all the others. So make of that what you will, I guess. Lastly, we have Amazon AWS, which I'll touch on. It's, it's worth a mention. Pricing wise, it is far too difficult to go into here. Uh, but depending on your use case, I see AWS as probably being the most affordable storage of, of all, really. For example, I use a Mac based uh, security CCTV system called Security Spy. And that has a feature that copies the CCTV footage into AWS. I currently have half a terabyte in AWS and I'm paying less than $2 per month. Now, the issue here is their pricing takes into account so many other factors, the, the storage space you need, the number of transfers in, number of transfers out, archive, glacier storage, so, so many options, but it's cheap, very, very cheap. So it makes a, a great place to store backup files or, or files that you don't really need to access that often. Onto user experience, and, and this is where Amazon falls down, of course, and, and yes, because this isn't, uh, this is really targeted at businesses and not consumers. But you also have to do a bit of digging to find clients that allow you easy access to your data via, say, a, a map drive or, or FTP server or, or so forth. Nothing quite like the experience of just signing in with your, your username and password like everything else does. Backup and retention. Uh, so using AWS, you can also specify backups and configure them as often as you require. But again, this requires a, a fairly decent level of knowledge on, on how to browse around the AWS console, uh, but it certainly gives you the, the best options compared to the other providers. On to data sovereignty, as with Microsoft, when you create your storage pools, you can specify where you want them to be stored. So they check the boxes here too. Now on to reliability. 22nd of October 2019, there was an eight hour outage. August 31st, 2019, an outage in the US was another eight hour outage. February 2017, there was a circa three hour outage in the US. Other than this, there are generally multiple outages per year before this, and they seem to be fairly dramatic that are, they're off for, for hours rather than the one or two hours we see with lots of the other services. But then it is very affordable. And if you're just looking for, for storing files that you don't often need access to, like my CCTV uh, or archive data, then outages likely aren't really a, a big deal to us. The last one to get an honorable mention uh, would of course be Apple's own iCloud storage. 200 gig for 249 a month, two terabytes for 699 a month. User experience is probably where Apple would win here but only, of course, if you're on an Apple device. 
It seamlessly in integrates with, with all aspects of the Apple ecosystem from your photos, videos, music, backing up your mobile devices. It is just so easy to get to your data. Credit where credit is due, part of Apple's whole existence is around just making sure everything just works. And they do succeed at this in, in many areas. When it comes to backup, this is where it gets tricky. In a nutshell, it is difficult to near impossible to reliably and automatically back up the contents of your iCloud storage. There are also no clearly documented retention periods for, for how long Apple will store deleted files. So in the event of accidentally deleting something and, and only realizing a few months later, you'll have pretty much little to no options to recover. With Apple, you will never know precisely where your data actually is. In 2018, Apple disclosed that their, their data is stored on both Amazon and Google's commercial cloud storage system. So that could cover anywhere effectively. Now, if we take a look at the reliability and uptime for iCloud, well, since iCloud sits on the back of other platforms, it's a similar story to the above. Research shows multiple outages throughout 2019 in May, June, July, October, a four hour outage in March, one in December, and that's just on the first page of the Google search results. So likely not the most reliable to use as your primary means of storage. As to which service is best of, of all of the above? Well, it depends is the answer. Um, if you're looking for cheap storage that you don't mind getting your hands on, uh, or rather fingers dirty in learning how to connect you to your data, then AWS, hands down, I'd say. If you're in the Office 365 ecosystem already, OneDrive makes perfect sense, as does the Google Drive or File Sync and Recover or Stream thing if you're a G Suite user. Dropbox does seem the general go-to for many business users, but that I think is mostly down to people not realizing you have storage at your fingertips in, in Google Drive or, or Office 365. So you could actually look to save some money by moving your data from Dropbox over to one of those existing services. With Apple, well, personally, I wouldn't store anything business related on it, un unless of course your whole business operates from the Apple ecosystem, your iPhones, Macs, the lot, but, but even then sharing becomes quite difficult. So that is pretty much everything for this week. A quick overview of all the platforms. Hopefully I've not done anyone a disservice by saying the wrong thing about the wrong products. Most of this is based on my experience of using each of the platforms and, and some quick researching online. For those interested, so we obviously use Office 365 heavily within Techers. We have a lot of our data stored within Office 365 in SharePoint and OneDrive. Personally, I actually have my files in a G Suite business account for my personal side of things. So I'm, I'm moving, as I said previously, moving my data into there and, um, and yeah, I have positive things to say about both Google and 365. So there is no Office 365 versus G Suite uh, thing here. They've both got their own positives, um, both got some drawbacks. And um, yeah, I'll leave it to you to make your own decisions. Thanks as always for watching. Of course, like the video if you did, subscribe if you're not already, hit the bell icon on YouTube to be notified of our future videos. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you, bye-bye.